Jack, thank you so much for coming back on the Easy Prey podcast today. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be back. So uh, a while back, we talked about in episode 103, we talked about pet scams. And since then, you have done a, a ton of work kind of behind the scenes in the in the in the soft and dirty underbelly of this <laughs> world. Uh, so let's talk about that. But first, kind of let the audience know who, who haven't heard of you, who you are and what you do. Yeah, sure. So um, my name's Jack Whitaker. I'm a PhD candidate by trade at the University of Surrey. Um, I also help to run petscams.com with, with a great group of volunteers. Um, and basically we track down a lot of pet scam websites operating on the internet. Uh, they come from Cameroon primarily. And we uh, put warning signs up to basically help people. So our website ranks higher than the actual pet scam website. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it works brilliantly. <laughs> 17,000 comments from people in you know the four years that it's been running says a lot. <laughs> so that's a lot of pet scams. So let's talk real quick about how the pet scams operate to the public. And then yeah. let's talk about what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so a pet scam is actually, it's a fairly rudimentary scam. I think it's very well known now. Um, I get asked to do lots of interviews about them now. So that it's definitely in the, in the media's eye. Um, particularly during COVID, we had a, a huge growth in pet scams. Um, because obviously people are locked at home, they're feeling lonely, therefore they want a fluffy companion. Um, and I, I should make a distinction at this stage. A pet scam isn't, um, in, in the context that I'm dealing with, not where you order a micro pig, it turns up and six months later it's hogging the couch. Um, that's not the type of pet scam we're dealing with. What we're dealing with is not a consumer dispute, it is cyber criminals who set up websites by the thousand. They advertise them on Google ads, social media, basically anywhere that allows advertisements. Um, and effectively what happens is you pay a deposit for a pet, then you pay the shipping fee for a pet, uh, then you pay the veterinary fee for a pet, then you pay the quarantine fee for a pet, then you pay the COVID injection fee for a pet, then you pay um, the blackmail attempt fee for the pet, which is puppy abandonment. And basically the scam continues ad infinitum um, until the victim either runs out of money or you know, at some point twigs that it's a scam. It's, um, it's a very despicable scam because it, much like romance scams, it um, triggers the hearts of people as well as their bank accounts. Um, so very despicable. Um, and it's, it's quite well documented. There's a lot of material out there about them now. Yeah, that's awful. And it's important to that distinction. This is not not a puppy mill scam, not not a, a legitimate, a, well, quote unquote, legitimate breed, not someone that actually has puppies that is selling them in poor health or something like that. But there never was a puppy. There never was a breeding program. It's all okay. just a, a figment of someone else's imagination. 100%, yeah. Um, and the sad thing, too, is, is that there's a lot of innocent third parties who are damaged by this. Um, the websites use um, IPATA um, logos, which are the International Pet Transport Association, so they get impacted. Then you have legitimate breeders that are impacted um, because their websites are being cloned and used. And then lastly as well, you have um, random people who are being impacted. I've talked many, many times with people who have had 20, 30 people turn up at their houses because oh. the scammer has actually picked them out because the house was recently for sale on Google. Um, and then people turn up and abuse them, throw bricks through their windows, threaten them, et cetera. Um, oh. So there's a, there's, a, there's a whole bubble of just evilness happening um, beyond what is merely, you know, the person being defrauded. So you've had the opportunity to uh, engage with a number of these scammers at a variety of different levels. Let, let's yeah. talk about how the, how the, the back end of this scam looks and who's involved and why. Yeah. 100%. So um, this was effectively for my PhD research, um, which I was quite fortunate in that I got to pick something I feel very, I feel very passionate about. Um, so I wasn't, you know, going off trying to, you know, reinvent the wheel or something. Um, I actually got to do a project on fraud enablement. Um, and what I found is, is that it's sometimes, I'm not going to say in all cases, um, not the same people who are scamming this or creating the websites themselves. What I've actually found is, is that there is an entire economy that exists 
that um, involves um, building fraudulent websites and also laundering the money behind that. So, um, and in total, I managed to interview 14 of these so-called crime enablers. Um, and also I should mention as well, they're not just building pet scam websites, they're building things like Ukrainian charity scam websites, um, marijuana websites, COVID PP websites, gun websites, automobile websites, um, and also primary commodities too, as well as a whole load of other websites. Um, some of the more despicable ones that I've come across are reborn dolls, um, where someone has had a miscarriage or lost an mm. infant and they're looking to, you know, buy a doll. Um, and unfortunately, I see a lot of those as well. Um, and also things that people can be shamed over. So sex dolls is an example of that. So they build a whole myriad, a whole you know, economy of fraudulent websites. Um, and these guys were all based in Cameroon. And they're from so, the so-called Anglophone region, um, which is actually a region that's in civil war at the moment, or a de facto civil war with the government of Cameroon. Um, and that's actually been a major catalyst for the uptick in the number of scams that are happening. Um, and I can I can delve into those reasons, but I think you probably want to ask me a few more rudimentary ones first. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll start with that. So are, are these guys legitimate website builders that are building websites for clients around the world, or are they just exclusively uh, building websites for criminal organizations? That's a very interesting question that you've asked. And what I've actually come across is that um, there are two kinds out there. There are guys who are just doing it for the syndicates themselves. And actually they are themselves part of the syndicate. Um, and then more interestingly, I've come across um, website developers, as you pointed out, that are legitimate. Uh, well, supposedly legitimate on, on the face of things, they're legitimate. They have websites where they do all manner of work. Um, I've come across ones where they are teachers, lecturers at universities. Um, they offer training packages to people from the countryside. Um, they do graphic design. Um, there's even one guy that I spoke to who was an editor for a YouTube channel. Um, so it's amazing, you know, to find out what your web developer does on the side that you don't know about. And effectively, what they do is they they manage a portfolio. Um, and I've noticed that. In the case of the guys who only do some fraudulent website building, they don't like to immerse themselves in that. They like to have it as a sort of camouflaged economy on the side mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, um, I've got my bread and butter. And then they spend their, you know, which they do during the nine to five hours. And then they'll go home at night and just power out fake websites for their, you know, gang member clients. Um, so it was really quite interesting. And then I also met um, another guy um, and his entire job is cashing gift cards, um, which he does on the side of building fake websites. Um, and he's, he, was a, he was a gangster, that guy. <laughs> he was a bad man. He's not, he's not the type of guy that you go for a beer with, put it like that, but he gave me one hell of an interview. So hats off to him. So, so are some of these people trying to have a legitimate occupation kind of an legitimate life and they're doing this to supplement their income or like in the name or this one guy it's like oh i know what i'm doing is fraudulent i'm a criminal there's no there's no hiding behind it well they well they all know what they're doing is bad um it's it's just notorious in cameroon what they're doing um it, it, for example one of the interviewees told me um you know, if you're building a pet website in Cameroon, you just know instantly it's for a bad guy. Um, so they, they all know exactly what they're doing. But the nice thing is, is that um, they don't actually get looked into by, the, by um, the police for their activities because the police are too busy looking for the scams themselves mm -hmm. to extort them for money. Oh. Um, so what happens is, and um, I should explain too, so um, 12 of the guys that I spoke to were based in a little uh, city called Bamenda which is in the Anglophone region of Cameroon. Um, and effectively, because of the civil war, there's a number of sort of push and pull factors behind what they're doing. Um, so most, most of them, I think, I mean, I'm gonna go in a naive angle here and take what they've told me at face value. They don't actually want to be doing it that much, some of them. Um, mm -hmm. However, there's some of them that realize, you know, I don't wanna be just surviving, I wanna be thriving. So they, they immerse themselves in it because they realized that 90, I got, I got a figure of between 70 and 90% of websites that, they, they'll, that they'll get asked to build a fake. 
um, and they just immerse themselves in it. They'll they'll just disregard any legit clients and they'll just say, I'm only doing work for scammers. Is that because the scammers will pay them more, be in a weird sense, a better yeah. client in that the scammers just build it. I'm going to pay you the money. I don't care. I need whether to it has that this answer a bit, actually. Yeah. So, because legitimate business called... people could be like really, really picky about their website. Oh, can you move this over a little bit? Oh, can you change this color? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're very true. Um, I think, I think I have to get more into sort of the different reasons and unpack them a bit here. So on, on the one hand, what I've seen is so-called push factors, which um, actually push these guys into enabling, you know, I don't think too many of them went to university and actually wanted to become cyber criminals. Um, but what I've noticed is, is that the civil war in Cameroon has facilitated that in terms of their willingness to participate in, in crime. So in, in essence, what I found is, is that the civil war was creating things like um, electricity cutoffs. And then they have what's called um, a ghost town, which was a really fascinating concept for me to learn about. So what happens is these guys, they don't actually work, you know, Monday to Friday like we do. They work Monday to Saturday and they take Sunday and Monday off. And the reason for that is what they have what's called a ghost town on a Monday, which is where everyone gets told you have to go inside now or the, the separatist troops are going to kill you. No. Um, so... Effectively, what happens is, you know, some some ghost towns, they don't actually have access to the Internet and stuff. So if you're a legit client and you hire a web developer from Bermenda, you, for example, might not hear from him for three days because he's having an electricity cut off. Um, and that was actually a very common occurrence during my interviews where these guys, I had to put my volume on 100 in some cases because the Wi-Fi was that bad over there. Um, and then I'd get random cutoffs during the interviews. And you're thinking, and, and these guys were saying to me, how do you expect us to interact with a legit client? Um, and then the guy, and then you, you also have other factors too, which is FDI, foreign direct investment, has now left the region itself. Um, so they don't actually have a lot of clients that they can, a lot of legit clients that they can do work for. Um, so you, are, you have sort of a, you know, a pirate's cove type scenario where the only people that are left now are scammers. Is it the same sort of thing that uh, because the government has uh, kind of collapsed or completely collapsed, that financial institutions are also unstable and that like you can't send them money in a normal traditional bank transfer rate and they don't have credit card processing? Um, from, from my understanding, they do have banks over there, but um, the main problem they have is, is that the police clocked on that when they were cashing out. So um, they actually had to get smarter. So they started using things like crypto. Um, and also the main one that came up was an app called Cash App. Mm -hmm. um, and if you use Cash App, then, you know, happy days for the scammer, effectively. Um, so that, that was also another reason. Um, I should also mention, too, um, one really fascinating thing that came up was that there's a so-called scam attacks which is basically where I found that um, scammers, of course, they have to invest in things, you know, like domains and uh, cashing out. Mm -hmm. And they're actually losing up to 50% of their income um, from paying for services to support their criminal activities. Um, one interviewee, um, well, actually a consistent theme among the interviewees and uh, was that they upcharged the scammers. So you can, you can upcharge a scammer 30% more than you would a legitimate client because yeah. they have the money. Um, in the words of one of my interviewees, we really fuck them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's that was quite interesting to learn. Yeah, the, the syndicates are better paying clients. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, but, of course, then you have, um, you know, security issues. They're um, looking for reasons to sleep at night and all that sort of stuff, which I think contributed a lot to why some of them wanted to speak to me in the first place which is you have some that are, you know, jack the lad types and they want to brag and, you know, talk. Um, then you have some that simply wanted to use the interview time as a form of therapy um, where they could purge their conscience of, of, you know, what they consider to be things that they're doing that are immoral. Um, and then you, there, were, there was one guy that I spoke to, well, actually two, and they were just bad people. <laughs> they were so, career criminals. So for the ones that were... Uh, struggling with what they were doing and, and, and using you as a therapy session, <laughs> what ultimately was the reasoning of 
the justification they gave for why they were working with the criminal syndicates when they knew people were being taken advantage of as a result of their work? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so like I've already explained, um, one of the reasons was lack of legitimate work. Um, and then one, one other reason that popped up quite a few times is, is um, mutualization, which is that these people um, put it out of their mind, you know, the impact that it's having on the, the, the person that's being defrauded. Um, the words greedy Westerner came up a few times, for example, yeah. um, which was quite a common reason. Um, and then you also had other factors that came in. So it was like, oh, you know, I have that many dependents, you know, in, in Cameroon, you know, as the, as the working age male of the family, I've got to support my wife, my kids, pay the bills, my mother, my father. Oh, and by the way, my mother's having cancer treatments. Um, so it was, you know, those types of rationalizations too. Um, so, and then, and then also as well, on top of that, just to add to the neutralization as well, um, you had guys that had grown up their entire lives around um, the criminals themselves. But you had things like religion get in the way at that stage where they said, oh, I'm a Christian, um, therefore I can't become a scanner. What I can do though is enable. Mm. Um, so they saw enabling as a lesser form of offending effectively. Um, and then as well, um, I suppose another reason that people spoke to me is um, it's not the type of thing that you can sort of go to the local bar and have a beer over. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there was that. <laughs> I mean, um, were and there... another thing too is um, I, I should probably explain that be because of the civil war at the moment, um, many of them are moving further afield. So they're going to places like Douala, Yaoundi. Um, this is the scammers and also the web developers. And what they're doing is they're getting there and they're flashing money. Um, and they're flashing lots of it and they're going to the best nightclubs, you know, the best bars. Um, then you have francophones, the French speakers who are going, where did that guy get all that money from? Mm. And they're starting to recruit syndicates also in, in these cities as well. So it's unsurprising that many of the pet scammers that you'll see um, are not only the anglophone speakers, but also the, Francos the francophones too these days. Um, and I think also as well, one thing that I found really interesting is, is that um, some of my interviewees, they really, really hate their clients. They, they look down on them so much um, and they consider what they're doing to be um, a form of superiority, um, which was really interesting. And um, I, I said to them, so, you know, what do you, what do you actually think of, of the guys that do it? You know, your clients that come and see you, they, they, they referred to many of them as idiots. And they said, I don't know how these guys are actually making money. Um, and they saw themselves as superior in that context. So even though they're not economically su superior, they're more technically superior. And that was their way of um, bragging effectively. Kind of like I'm taking an advantage of the criminal organization by building websites for them at a rate that's unreasonably high. Yeah, if, if they were smarter, they know that someone else could do this for half the price that I do it. Yeah, exactly, 100%. Um, so that was, that was incredibly interesting. Um, I also, for the, for the benefit of your listeners too, I think one thing I found really interesting, and I've, I've spoken to colleagues at, um, you know, major internet service provider companies and also um, apps. And I think I managed to find quite a novel way that they're undertaking money laundering, um, which was absolutely fascinating. Um, so basically this guy that I spoke to was, um, he lives in Douala now, but he was originally Anglophone from the Abermenda region. Um, and he built a whole um, business around um, cashing and gift cards. And he, open, he advertises this openly on Facebook, Instagram, um, and he's got bucket loads of, of posts, you know, saying, come and cash your gift cards in with me. That might say something about internet governance yeah. and the liability <laughs> of platform providers. Um, but effectively what he does is um, someone will send him a gift card from America the mule operating in the States or the scammer themselves. Then what he does is he has a friend um, and his friend is an app creator. And that app that the friends created conveniently has in-app purchases. So then he gets told, oh, um, do you fancy buying my audio book? Do you fancy buying you know, some in-app purchases? And then a couple, of a couple of days to a couple of weeks later, depending on the type of gift cards, whether that's Amazon or iTunes, et cetera, um, that app money, once the app company has taken its royalties off, will pop out with the app creator. He will then take his cuts and then send the remainder back to the um, 
the chap who was doing the caching. Okay, so the so, app stores are actually laundering money. So the uh, victim in, let's say, the victim in Los Angeles buys a hundred dollar iTunes gift card, mm -hmm. hands it off to a mule who yeah. maybe they get twenty percent uh, or or ten percent or something like that. Thirty percent. Thirty percent. Okay, so we're down yeah. to seventy bucks. But now yeah. that hundred dollar gift card goes to someone in Cameroon who then yeah. takes it to this guy yeah. who uh, buys, uh, makes an in-app purchase. Yep. Yeah. So, so how much is a scammer getting at the end of the day from a hundred dollar gift card after um, everybody, a, after the mule has taken his cut, the, the launderer has taken his cut, the app developer has taken his cut. Yeah. And, so, and, and the guy transporting the cash between the, <laughs> the bank accounts has taken his cut. Yeah, so in effect, um, the app creator gets one out of ten dollars, one point five dollars, and the um, the cashier, as he's known, gets another one point five dollars out of the ten dollars. Um, so that's they're losing thirty percent in that case, and then they're also spending an additional twenty percent then on rebuilding all the websites that they've had shut down now because the victims have reported them. Um, so yeah, there's there's quite a comp quite an interesting economy going on here, and then also you've got things like passive facilitation. So as well as as well as your you know your gift you know your app app companies that are taking their slice, you've then got things like domain name registrars and hosting providers, who are then taking their slice for the registration of domains. So suddenly you have this whole economy here of active and passive facilitation going on, which is phenomenal. And it and it really sounds like the the vast majority of the money disappear. I don't want to say disappears. Gets siphoned off by so many people who touch it before it gets back to the the yeah, person running 100%. the running it. Yeah, exactly. And then of course, on top of that as well, you've then got police. And if you get picked up by the police, you're probably losing up to eighty percent of your haul at that at that stage. Then maybe a hundred percent too. Um, there was, there was one guy who I spoke to, which was fascinating. Um, he was a scammer um, and he now works full-time for a syndicate. He builds about 1,500 pet scam and marijuana scam websites a year. Um, and he said to me that when he was scamming, the reason he stopped is, is the police were camped out at the local bank that he went to to pick up the wire transfers. Um, and then what the police would do is they'd arrest him. And they'd steal his ID and then go and make the cash pickup and then release oh. him the next day. Um, so yeah, that was that was quite interesting. And also as well, another couple of interesting points around that is um, in Vermenda, because of the Civil War, the police or the security services set up roadblocks, and they're looking for things. They're looking for how you dress, the type of phone that you have, um, the, the type of car that you drive. So. Scammers, are, I think they said that they're usually driving Toyotas. So at that stage, if you're seen with any of those warning signals, you're going to have to show that police officer all of your phone. Um, if there's anything on there, for example, a picture of an animal, that's it. You're, get, you're getting extorted for money. Um, and you know, one guy that I spoke to the other day said he had a gun pulled out on him and shoved in his head because they thought he was a scammer. But luckily, he was just the enabler, though, so they <laughs> let him go. <laughs> So what is the, what what is the you know what is the consumer to do if the government and the police are effectively complicit or are they themselves are extorting the scammers? I mean, is there really any out other than waiting for Cameroon to have a stable government? Yeah, I mean, Paul Beer, the dictator of Cameroon, is eighty nine now, I think. So uh, we're just waiting for him to die and see what happens. Um, but on the in terms of once the main i mean it's, it's so cliched isn't it but the main thing is try not to get scammed in the first place because yeah. the moment that money hits a mule in the states or even um you know one, uh, someone in cameroon that's it you are never seeing that money again um i think there's a lot of very good organizations out there um i'll name siberia for example um even i don't do any work with them but i think they're really brilliant what they're doing and um they're helping to get things like bank accounts shut down i think what the what should be done more so is actually targeting host country mules um and the fbi actually has to put a lot more um attention to so-called volume crimes which mm -hmm. is lots of people stealing lots of money sorry stealing small amounts of money out of lots of people 
Yeah. Because at the moment, fraud triggers are only, they're, they're triggered in probably, I think it was $100,000 these days or something obscene like that. So they actually need a mechanism for investigating prolific mules in the States. Um, and that definitely needs looking into. And even, you know, stronger measures at uh, the Apple iTunes, the Apple Store and Google yeah. Store, Play Store, app developers, kind of a, a tighter brain on them. Yeah, um, I think the difficulty is, though, um, I, I was speaking to one of the app companies um, that were involved in this from my interviews, and, and they said to me, OK, great, this is amazing. By the way, how do we go about finding all these apps? <laughs> And then that takes someone a lot smarter than me to figure out. Um, but from, you know, there's a couple of trigger points that you can work with a couple of vectors, which is look for an app that hasn't got a lot of downloads, look for an app where someone is making, you know, or where there's a lot of money going through it all at once, find out the increments that that money's going into. And then you might have a vector for flagging up those, um, you know, money laundering apps. Um, I think I mean, and I've always you would, said this you would, you would think that like Apple would have uh, through big data, like we know what normal in-app purchases look like. And I'm sure some people are reporting stolen iTunes gift cards to them. So you'd suspect that like, gee, this app brand new has a, a surprisingly few downloads, but surprisingly high in-app purchase rate, all with iTunes gift cards, not with anyone who's actually loading it from their credit card. Like, yeah. you you wonder if is, yeah. you know, Apple um, actively yeah. taking these, I mean, it, it, and the reality could be that Apple is actively shutting these things down, but they're just not talking about it. That's the thing. Um, I will tell you though that, a major internet company that I was speaking to where one of the gift cards goes through, and I'm not going to name any names, um, they hadn't got the foggiest about what was happening. Um, and they were just amazed at what I brought to them, which I was, at first I was excited about and I was fairly horrified about. Um, but I think, you know, one, the particular Silicon Valley company that I'm talking about, my colleague said that they're a bit like a bodybuilder trying to run. They've got all the right bits, but they don't know how to use it properly. <laughs> Um, and that's the thing. And, and because this type of crime is such a niche type of crime, it needs experts. Um, I, I think that some of the groups who are doing a lot of good need to work together a lot more to help educate these companies. I think the companies need to be working with these groups. Um, I think that um, these groups operate on the fringe of vigilantism, um, me included, with petscams.com. Um, I, the only reason that I've managed to sort of have some breakthrough is because I use my real name. A lot of the guys that I work with don't. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think there has to be some chances to be taken. Um, and this is going to sound deeply cynical of me, um, but I have a colleague that does a lot of work on romance scams. And his conclusion was um, dating platforms actually need a percentage of fake profiles to actually look like there's more people than there are on there. A bit like the Elon Musk situation with Twitter. Yeah, I mean, um, and and that's you know that was the reality with Ashley Madison, with yeah. with their data breach was oh gosh you know there really weren't that many women on the platform they were all bots. Yeah, yeah. Designed exactly. to get money out of the guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think you know one thing I would like to say um, during this time together is um, for any you know researchers or security professionals that are listening I. I I'd love to see more research on interviews with cyber criminals. I think that there is a, a trove of data that we can explore. And I think it takes a particular, a particular kind of crazy to do it, where you have to be willing to fire off 2000 emails a day for several months to different websites or different phishing kits or whatever. Um, and you have to be willing to become a very repulsive version of yourself where you have to start developing a relationship with a cyber criminal, which is something I was fairly horrified about. But then, you know, once you sort of, you have to find a way to bury sort of all of the victim comments that you've seen and all the horror that they've done in the world mm -hmm. and humanize them, um, which was a very disturbing process for me to go through. Um, and once you've got through that, you've, you've spent the months and you've built the relationship because they're going to immediately assume that you're police and that you want to arrest them. Um, once you've gone through all the loopholes, you can learn an awful lot from them. 
Um, and I, I, you know, that's my sort of my sacred message today. <laughs> Please go and talk to them, but safely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so before we started recording, we talked a little bit about kind of the the ethics of what you're doing. Of like, okay, yeah. well, I know someone's committing a crime. Yeah. Okay, should I report them? Should I not report them? If I mm -hmm. report them, I'm reporting them to corrupt police who are then going to turn around and extort them. Yeah, yeah. Is there a certain amount of, oh gosh, I, I hate to phrase it this way, uh, ethical gymnast gymnastics? <laughs> yeah, really. You should have seen or that. Like, heck, this, like, responded with. Like, like, this is just research, and this is what you just have to do to do research. Yeah, I mean, you've got to get your hands dirty if you're digging for gold at the end of the day. Um, my my university ethics committee were not best pleased. Um, I had about four months of review go on for this. And I think if you're working for a company or something and you can get, you know, a sign off for this, it's, it's a great opportunity. I think academic researchers such as myself, we have more loopholes to jump through. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the minimum obligation that I have, um, and this is sort of legal here, is that under the Fraud Act, I'm in the UK, so under the Fraud Act 2006, making an article that's used in fraud is considered itself um, an offence. So my justification for it was that if the actor that I'm talking to talks about making a fake website that has specifically been used in defrauding a UK citizen and they name that citizen, I have to report that to the police. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was that was my ethical um, ramification of that project. I think there are other ethical dilemmas that we have to go through, though, which is, should we be paying cyber criminals for their time? Yeah. Particularly in the case of my interviews, that was a major thing that came up with me because these guys, you know, even though they are by de facto offenders, they are business people. Um, some of them have likable characteristics. Um, some of them will feed you sob stories. Um, you know, should you be reimbursing them for that one hour, two hour time frame that they are going to be talking to you and uncovering all of the secrets and potentially putting themselves at risk? Um, I came to the decision no. Um, and the simple decision is, is that you are rewarding somebody for the crime that, that they're involved in. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be rewarding somebody for that. But I think that if you're someone with a slightly different moral compass than me, that's perfectly reasonable, maybe. Um, but, you know, that's that's for your own conscience to grapple over. <laughs> well, it, it, it's the idea of is exposing the, uh, the totality of what's happening of a higher value to, to society than the little bit of money that I paid this guy to tell me about it. Yeah, exactly. It's like if, a bit like if, if, um, if I pay him $20 to stop $2,000 worth of crime, was that a good investment? Yeah, exactly. 100%. <laughs> um, it's exactly like the police in the US using informants, for example, and letting some of the drug shipments get through before nailing the, the bigger fish. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it's it's all these ethical dilemmas that we have on a day to day level when you're working in criminal criminological research. Um, I mean, I've I've read all sorts, um, particularly around drug research. I had to really delve into the legal ramifications of what I was doing. I mean, there was stuff coming up with um, things like drug research. I'm a drug researcher. Should I be taking drugs with the people that I'm, you know, interviewing? That type of thing. Um, you know, and it, it, it's the old case as well of you know, undercover police officer wants to catch a pimp. You know, does he have sex with a prostitute to justify, you know, catching that person because the, the girl might say something during the process, all that sort of stuff. I think, I think, you know, as well, for, as well as for criminals, if you want to be a good researcher in, you know, in crime science or in infosec in anywhere, you very unfortunately, if you want to get the really juicy stuff, have to get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunately inevitable. And so I'm wondering, so your initial Fourier and your expertise and your and your way into this has mm -hmm. been through the pet scams. Are these guys legit just saying this is my vertical? We, you know, Syndicate A, we own the pet scam vertical, or is this just one of uh, dozens of moving targets? Yeah, it's um, it's a very fascinating question that and. Um... I've been fed different pieces of information from different people in that respect. I don't, I don't think the the guys that I spoke to care because they're making money as it is. But 
my understanding was there is a almost um, hierarchy behind fraud, behind online fraud. And depending on the type of scam or fraud that you're doing, um, that denotes where you are in that hierarchy. Um, I, I got information that said drug scams were at the lowest level of the hierarchy because a guy's only going to order, you know, $70 worth of weed mm -hmm. on the internet. Um, so they're making, you know, chicken bits, for example. Um, there was one guy that I spoke to, um, which was fascinating because he was working for um, a syndicate that specialized in, in mineral fraud and gold fraud. And this type of stuff gets dangerous because what they're doing is they're luring um, investors to Africa to effectively hold them to ransom. Oh, wow. Um, and that was considered, from what I understood, at the higher end of the totem pole um, because you can extort someone for their life's worth. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, what, what, what I found really interesting too is, is that um, the, the various countries have, um, to quote the words of Adam Smith, absolute advantage over the types of crime that they're doing. Um, for example, I, I learned that, you know, whilst the Cameroonians are busy doing, um, you know, non-delivery fraud, you have your Nigerians and your Ghanaians doing romance fraud, for example. Um, and what I, what I found very fascinating about it is, is that the pet scam, which was the first scam to come along in Cameroon before, you know, the stuff like corn sales, you know, dolls, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, it, was, it was an iteration of the 419 scam. Um, and basically, you had a lot of Nigerian guys that were living in Bamenda at the time, um, who ran businesses, shops, and they all used to congregate at the local internet cafe, and all the Nigerians brought 419 with them. And the Cameroonians thought, wow, that's really good. I like stealing from the white man. Um, and then after that, a um, couple of entrepreneurial Cameroonian students at the local university then decide, um, yeah, okay, why don't we start doing this with pets? They made a small fortune um, and then everyone else jumped the bandwagon. Um, then uh, after the civil war started, it just accelerated massively. So that's the state that we live in now. Um, societally in Cameroon, in the Anglophone region, it's accepted. Um, in the younger generation, it's very accepted. Um, apparently they still have, um, you know, th there's still a sense of traditional family values. Um, one, one web creator said to me, I don't know how a mother could sleep at night knowing her son is doing something like that. Um, mm. And uh, a lot of the parents are turning blind eyes to it um, because it is primarily the youth that are doing this. It's, it's young men from the school age of about 15 to about the age of 30. Um, and then it's considered that they might drop out um, or they'll go you know, professional at that stage. Um, so. Is it that they're looking at kind of verticals that are uh, luxur lux luxury type purchases? Like, well, nobody needs marijuana to, you know, no one needs to buy marijuana online to, to go about their day. No one needs to have a pet. No one needs to have this or that. Or is it just purely opportunistic? Well, because um, I assume during yeah. COVID, it, it's you know, fake drug, uh, fake COVID tests, fake PPE, fake yeah. you know, is it just opportunistic? Yeah, I think I think on one side of it, you've got opportunism. So with your legitimate legal products, um, corn sales um, is the one I always go to for that. Also things like um, food products, um, engines. For some reason, outboard engines are big at the moment. Um, cars, they're all opportunity, they're large quantity scams, and they're being cheeky, thinking they can get away with it. On the other side, um, are you a Breaking Bad fan? I'm not, but let's okay. assume the listeners there, there, are. Yeah, there, there's a quote from Nacho Varga, which is, um, I love ripping off criminals because criminals have no recourse. Um, mm. And that's the other side of it, which is you can sell things like black tar heroin, um, human organs, um, I saw one which was for a very weird piece of museum um, collectors, which was a boy who choked on a marble, all of his internal organs. Um, then there were, there, there were, there's also other, any type of legal product. That's all about um, shame and extortion. Um, and also, you know, criminals, if it, well, again, it's whether you consider them criminals, but if you're buying those types of illegal products, um, who are you gonna go, go and complain to afterwards? 
Um, so it's it's pretty much a guaranteed win for them there. Um, yeah. So horses for courses. Uh, no one calls up the police and says, uh, someone sold me fake cocaine. I want my money back. Yeah, it's a bit like the hooker taking your wallet. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you don't have a lot of recourse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you implicate yourself in the criminal activity by trying to find recourse. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and I find that really fascinating as well, because um, it makes me wonder, you know, we have different reporting facilities, like um, in the UK, we've got the Action Fraud Reporting Statistics, we've got in the FBI IC3, you know, how, how much of a real gauge are they actually getting of the true nature of online fraud? If you have, you know, these types of scams or frauds going on out there, which are defrauding people that are buy, trying to buy illegal products. And um, I th or, you know, relying on some sort of shame, for example, you know, a parent that's lost a child and wants a reborn doll um, or someone that's trying to buy a sex doll online, you know, they're not going to report that. Yeah. So, you know, how much are we actually missing out on? I think it's going to be huge. Um, so that's my, my small take on it anyway. Yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of people, once they, if it's a small scam, once they figure it out, it's like, uh, well, I've lost the money. 100%. And that's the other factor too. Which and is, what are the police going to like? Okay. The guys in Cameroon, what's, what's my local police department going to do? Like they're not, they're not going to be able to keep the website from being built. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I taught my, there, there's some interesting facts that I was teaching my students on um, cyber crime module that my supervisor teaches, which is um, if you commit a murder, there's only a 12% chance that you're going to get away afterwards. If you're a cyber criminal and you do it properly, you're pretty much 97% guaranteed not to get arrested. And then, you know, couple with doing a volume crime like these guys are doing in a war-torn country where there isn't an extradition, an extradition treaty, um, then yeah, hey, you're, you're pretty much set to go. Um, for example, the big Silicon Valley tech company that I was speaking to, they have all the resources in the world. Um, I said to them, you know, why don't, they were asking me for mule data in the States. And I said, why don't we actually go after one of the big boys in Cameroon? They said to me, whoa, no way, we can't do that. Um, all we can do is, uh, you know, is find them. And then the guy's going to sit there, laugh at it and carry on with his day. Um, so that's about as far as you can get, really. Um, and it's it's quite horrible, really, that it's only the same with nation state hackers, though, where, you know, the North Koreans can do what they like. Because who's going to extradite North Korea? <laughs> yeah. I mean, does it fall back on the platform, the platforms that are being used, the, the hosting, like tighter legislation on the and requirements on the hosting companies, the companies that, I don't know, tighter, tighter rules and regulations around how gift cards can be used that, that make it so they can't just be, you know, read the number off the back and suddenly the money's halfway around the world. Guns don't kill people. People kill people, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, if we were to look at technology from the instrumentalism perspective, that's what we'd be saying, Yeah. which is, you know, technology is neither good nor evil. It simply serves the human that is using it. I take a slightly different view, which is that um, the so-called um, extension theory, which is technology extends um, human agency. So in effect, you know, technology can be, you know, good or evil. Um, I, I think there's a lot of pass, sorry, passive enablers, as I like to call them, that have a lot of proverbial blood on their hands. Um, and it's only, it takes pressure. And, you know, as infosec professionals, we have to be putting pressure on these companies. There is a huge deal of confusion at the moment around who governs domain name providers, domain name registrars. Yep. Previously, we thought that was ICANN. Um, ICANN, I think in 2018, released a blog post saying, we're not the internet police. Um, and then um, the, they've also kept their ICANN registrar accreditation agreement 2013, um, purposely um, with, with that, sorry, outside of the remits of, of moderating content abuse on websites. So their view is we simply need to keep who is accurate. By the way, 90% of who is is redacted these days. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, not much to do there, is there? Um, and, and, and that's always the, that's always the fight is if yeah. someone registers a domain name, should that information be public or it's private? Well, it's a yeah, huge exactly. push for it to be private now. 
Yeah, exactly. and I think, well, I, I've just collected about 2,700 fake websites. 95% of them use redacted who is. Um, and then also as well, companies clearly aren't investigating it. Um, there, there's a particular um, case that I'm aware of where the guy, um, I actually, I've spoken to him. Um, he registers his domains under the name um, Al Mamari Rashid Suleyan. Um, he claims to be in the city of Welshmi, which supposedly exists in Russia. There isn't a city called Welsh me that exists in Russia, and he also enjoys submitting invalid phone numbers. Um, and I, you know, you send that to the domain name registrar as one as an organisation um, that, that I know have done so. The organisation got a response back saying, um, "By the way, can you send a letter to the address of this person? If it's bounced, can you send it back to us to show proof that the city of Welsh me in Russia doesn't exist?" Um, so that is the, the terrible state of internet governance that we're in at the moment. Um, there, there was the particular case, I think Google was suing uh, Namecheap and Online Nick over the uh, domain name squatting incident last year, or maybe in 2020, I think it was 2020. Um, that went very quiet and Google were falling back on the ICANN registrar accreditation agreement for that. Um, saying that in, in the agreement it says that registrars have to promptly and timely investigate reports of abuse. Well, they emailed both of these registrars 12 times, no replies. Um, so again, we don't know the state of whether this transnational private regulator yeah. is actually you know, holding or legally viable. Um, so it's, it's a, to use the phrase, shit show. <laughs> yeah, it's... It's, uh, you know, I, I think it falls back on the, 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 the phrase buyer beware. You, yeah. you, you um, as a consumer have time. to do your yeah. due diligence and am I dealing yeah. with a real entity or not? Yeah, but at the same time though, um, I, th I think it's very easy for us to, you know, say the onus is on the consumer or the, the online data or the company employee that's having a BEC attack against them. But, how do you then begin to safeguard against vulnerable people? Increasingly, you know, we've got children who are the most digitalized, you know, generation in history. They're, they might not have had the internet safety talk at school. Um, and then you've got the elderly too. Um, particularly during COVID, we have had in the UK people that have been shielding, where they were told you cannot leave the house for anything. Um, mm -hmm. They had to start using the internet for the first time. Yeah. If we take the onus of saying that the you know the matter of internet safety protection is on them, we have we basically given up at that stage yeah. because we cannot protect the vulnerable in society. Um, however, the, on the flip side of that, if you're a policymaker, you're then thinking, do I really want to take Facebook to court? You know, have I got 130 million to spare? You know, in you know things like uh, legal bills, etc. So yeah, it's it's there's no safe answer. Yeah. I think I think we have to begin breaking up monopolies of large internet, uh, sorry, large tech companies now, but because you know they're they're becoming too big to fail and too big to sue in effect. Um, so yeah, it's it's I think it's deeply troubling times that we live in. I think the problem's going to get worse. However, there have been some successes, um, which is nice to see. I think. The major success that I've seen is, is that um, Namecheap were considered to be the largest facilitator of online fraud. Um, about a year ago, and this was really weird, um, they decided, hey, we're opening up our help desk, our help desk now. Um, send all of your abuse reports in. And they were just, just demolishing everything. Interesting. And I think they're still doing it now. And, and previously, they were known as a bulletproof registrar. Um, and I think what happened was um, they, they were getting that much grief on, on Twitter. It was severely damaging their company. Um, so they actually decided, hey, maybe we should start listening to the InfoSec community. So actually, you know, pressure does work. And it got to the stage where somebody even set up a troll name chief help desk. <laughs> um, and, you know, finally, the, you know, it flipped. Um, but I think I think you know as well as them taking down red you know domains that we report. You have to ask yourself, why are they allowing domains with Facebook with an O in being registered? Yeah, you know those types of situations in in the name of company fraud. Or why you know maybe we should actually begin checking registrant data. Um, why are we allowing you know one guy from Cameroon to register fifty pet websites and you know another sixty marijuana websites you know claiming to be in in the U.S. 
um, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, yeah, and, think... and then dropping those domain names a month later yeah, exactly. or six months later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think one thing that's really interesting is, is that crime enablers, the ones that I spoke to, they love it when domain names get reported um, because they make more money then because their oh. clients will begin uh, starting to order more domains. I need a new website. Exactly. Um, so I was really, I was thinking sort of outside the box here and I was actually wondering maybe if we could actually, you know, start paying web developers in Cameroon to send reports of what their clients are registering, <laughs> then we can actually build a database. Of this yeah, b- build a, uh, a tip line that yeah. for every fake website, fraudulent website you report, we'll send you some real money. Yeah. Yeah, and, that, exactly. and that and that might become, you know, their business model is I build the website and then I report it. Yeah, and then I get paid from the scammer again and also from the tip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I was I was thinking a lot about that. It sounds quite in, interesting. Um, but yeah, domain takedown is a good business for scammers. Um, and I, I was I was interested about this too because I said to them, don't the clients got start getting mad at you when their domains get taken down and they're like, oh no, they expect it. It's factored into their business model. Um, so yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, and, and it's harder when there's you know let's using Cameroon as the example when there's not a thriving legitimate economy. Yes. Exactly. I mean, if you wake up, you know, from an electricity blackout, um, you walk down the road, you know, you've got soldiers outside, um, you know, shooting down, um, you know, separatists. Um, And then, you know, you're trying to make a living. And no wonder these guys get disheartened at the situation. And out of frustration, they're starting to lash out and do work for scammers. Um, I I think it's a really depressing situation. Um, Yeah. I think one thing that I have learned from it is, and you know, some people might will probably might send me a couple of nice email threats about this. Um, I, I really don't think that we should be in in some circumstances viewing it with a nose versus them situation. I, I think, you know, and I've said this to colleagues before, if you were in their situation, how many of you would be doing illegal stuff yourself? I think about 90% of them said, yeah, probably me. Yeah. Um, so I think you know if the if the opportunities came, um, and I, I think if, if we if we withdrew the us versus them type attitude in some circumstances, then I think I think there's a potential there. Um, I think I think there's also you know other things that you can do. For example, if you don't believe in that, then you can look for you you know unique identifiers on websites and then start blasting uh, web developers' entire portfolios. Um, and then make the scammer actually lose trust with the web developer. Um, yeah. Then you can use that. But I mean, that won't solve the problem. It'll just make the guy go to the one of the other hundreds of web developers that are there. Because I mean, one, one thing I was fascinated about is is that the desensitization process that these guys are going through is incredible. Um, they go to university over there. They're all doing, you know, the, the guys that I spoke to, most of them were doing software engineering or computer science. Their entire class is scamming. The lecturers themselves know about it and they're laughing. To, you know, they'll make a joke and go, oh, the scammers at the back can answer this question. Um, so that was, you know, it's, it, they're just completely, you know, desensitized to it, which, you know, it's quite shocking. And to be honest with you, at the end of this project, I, I was starting to develop some sort of sympathy towards them um, until it went back onto petscams.com and I sort of saw the 17,000 victim comments and I reframed my mind a bit and thought, yeah, I know I can see their perspective, but you know, what they're doing isn't great. <laughs> yeah. It's, you can see their perspective, but it doesn't mean what they're doing is, is right. 100%. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, where, you know, how do you, how do you solve the problem? Um, I think, I think it's very, very difficult. It, 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 it's, it's not that something that we're going to solve on a, on a podcast today. <laughs> I wish I could. Yeah. But I think so, there's going to be smarter and better paid people out there to do it. Yeah. So if InfoSec people want to get a hold of you, people who have ideas and how to move forward and want to get a hold of you. Yeah. Um, so you can easily find me on LinkedIn, um, Jack Whitaker, um, 
luckily I use my real name, so um, I'm quite easy to find. Um, I also find me on my email address, which I'll give to you after. Um, and yeah, generally, if you're a security researcher listening and you sort of, you know, you want a bit of advice on how to approach bad guys to speak to them and you want to know how to groom their inner narcissisms and things, um, you know, feel free to come and reach out to me. Um, I think, I think, you know, I think you do need to have a chat with someone. Um, I was very fortunate in that I, I had the opportunity to go and meet um, an ex um, police superintendent in the city of London uh, before I started my project. And he started a blog uh, with one of his ex suspects that he had across the table three times called Diary of a Fraudster. Um, and he gave me, you know, all the things that I needed to know about safety and how to you know, negotiate the very sticky field of dealing with offenders. Mm -hmm. I think everyone needs to have that chat before they do it. So please feel free to reach out to me. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your discovery and your research with us today. Thank you very much, Chris. Pleasure to be back as usual.